how do we think about self-driving cars? The technology is essentially here, uh, and we now have to take a technology in which machines can make a bunch of quick decisions, oftentimes quicker than we can, uh, that could drastically reduce traffic fatalities, could uh, drastically improve uh, the efficiency of our transportation mm -hmm. grid, help solve things like uh, carbon emissions that are cause causing uh, the warming of the planet. Uh, but you know, Joey made a very s elegant and, and simple point, uh, which is, uh, what are the values that we're going to embed in the cars mm -hmm. if, in fact, we're going to uh, get all the benefits of self-driving cars, and how do we make the public comfortable with it? Now, some of it's just, right now, the, the overriding concern of the public is safety, uh -huh. right? The, the notion of essentially taking your hands off the wheel. Uh, but as Joey pointed out, there are going to be a bunch of choices that you have to make. You know, the classic problem being if the cars are driving and you can swerve to avoid a pedestrian uh, who maybe wasn't paying attention, it's not your fault. Uh, but if you swerve, you're going to go into a wall and might kill yourself. And how do you make the calculations about odds and airbags and speed and all that? That You, you can have that machine make that decision. Uh, but that's a moral decision, uh, not just a, a pure utilitarian decision. And uh, who's setting up those rules? Do we have broad consensus around what those rules are? That's going to be important. We're going to have the same set of questions when it comes to medicine. Um, you know, we have invested heavily in thinking about precision medicine or individualized medicine, thinking about how the combination of the human genome and uh, you know, uh, computer data uh, and, and a large enough sample size can potentially arrive at a whole host of cures, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, cancer. There are a whole bunch of interesting choices that we're going to have to make as we proceed in this because the better we get at it, the more predictive we are about certain genetic variations having an impact. Uh, how we think about insurance, how we think about uh, medical pricing, uh, who gets what, when, how. Is that something that we're going to hand out over to an algorithm? And if so, who's writing it? Uh, so, so these are going to be unavoidable questions. And I think that uh, Joy is exactly right, making sure that uh, the broad public that's not necessarily going to be following every single iteration of this debate still feels as if their voice is heard, they're represented, that the people in the room uh, are um, mindful of uh, a range of equities. Uh, that's going to be really important. And what is the role of government in that context as we start to get into these ethical questions? Well, my instinct is initially the role is a convener. The way I've been thinking about the regulatory structure as AI emerges is that early in a technology, uh, a thousand flowers should bloom, and the government should have a relatively light touch. Investing heavily in research, making sure that uh, there's a conversation between basic research and uh, applied research and you know, companies that are uh, trying to figure out how to apply it. Um, you know, a good example of, of where this has worked pretty well, I think, is in predicting the weather. Got big data, really complex systems. Government basically said, hey, we got all this data. And suddenly, a whole bunch of folks are gathering around and working with the National Weather Center and developing new apps. And we've actually been able to uh, predict an oncoming tornado three, four times faster than it used to be. That saves lives. That's, a, that's a, a good example of where the government isn't doing all the work initially, but is inviting others to participate. As technologies emerge and mature, then figuring out how they get incorporated into existing regulatory structures becomes a tougher problem, and the government needs to be involved a little bit more, not always to force the new technology into the square peg that exists, but maybe to change the peg. And you know, one of the things that we're trying to do, for example, is to get 
the Federal Drug Administration, the FDA, to redesign how it's thinking about genetic medicine when a lot of its rules, regulations were designed for a time when you know, it, it was worrying about a heart stent that right. Right. Uh, is a very different problem. So basic research from government, convening to make sure the conversations are happening, ensuring transparency, but as things mature, making sure that uh, there is a transition and, a, and, a, and a, a seamless way to get the technology to rethink regulations and, as Joey pointed out, making sure that um, the regulations themselves reflect a, a broad base set of values uh, because uh, otherwise, if it's not transparent, uh, you know, we may find uh, that uh, it's disadvantaging certain people, certain groups, or uh, that uh, the public is just suspicious of it. I can say one thing about that. Um, there, so, so there's, it ties to two things. So one is when we did the, this car trolley problem thing, we found that most people like the idea that the driver or the passenger could be sacrificed to save many people, but they would never buy that car. And <laughs> that, was, that was the sort of short version of the result. The, the other related thing, which is, I don't know if you've heard the neurodiversity movement, but this is a, this, if we solve autism, let's say, and Temple Grandin talks about this a lot. She says that you know, Mozart and Einstein and Tesla would all be considered autistic if they were here today. I don't know if that's true, the, but some- They might be on the spectrum. On the spectrum. Right. So if we were able to eliminate autism, um, and make everyone neural normal. normal. I, I bet a whole swath of MIT kids would not be the way they are. Right. And you, you, know, you probably wouldn't want Einstein no, I, as your I, kid. As, as, as somebody who was in Cambridge at, at the Harvard Law School, the, uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to echo that stereotype about uh, And, and, and some of the but, but, but some of the brilliant kids are kind of on the spectrum. And I think one of the things that's really important, whether we're talking about autism or just diversity broadly, yeah. one of the problems, I think, is that allowing the market and each individual to decide, okay, I just want a normal kid and I want a car that's going to protect me, is not going to lead to a maximum for the societal benefit. And I think that whether it's government or something, we can't just have this market driven. And I think a lot of these decisions are going to be this I, way. I think there's a great point. And it actually goes to the larger issue um, that we wrestle with all the time around AI, uh, and, and science fiction taps into this all the time. Um, part of what makes us human are the kinks. They're the mutations, they're the outliers, they're the flaws that create art or the new invention, right? I, we, we have to assume that if a system is perfect, then it's static. <laughs> and part of what makes us who we are, part of what makes us alive is that is dynamic, and we're surprised. One of the challenges that we'll have over time is to think about where are those areas where it's entirely appropriate for us just to have things work exactly the way they're supposed to without surprises. Now, so hey, airline flight might be a good example where you know I, I, I'm, I'm not that interested in having surprises. If, if I have a smooth flight every time, I'm it's fine. It's gonna be just fine. Right?